with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Economic activity all but ground to a halt earlier this year. It's rebounding now, but is that the same as a recovery? Tonight, we'll delve into the Canadian numbers to find out what a real recovery might entail. We'll also speak to Oxford University economist Ian Golden about what he's calling the butterfly defect and economic globalization in the context of a pandemic. It's Wednesday, September 9th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Between April and June, Canada's gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services produced in the country, recorded its steepest drop since they began tracking these things almost 60 years ago. But that was followed in June by the biggest month-to-month -month bounce back on record. And if walking down the street can tell us anything, economic activity does seem to be making a comeback. So are we on the road to recovery and is a return to normal visible on the horizon? Let's find out from these three folks in the nation's capital. Trevin Stratton, who's the chief economist and vice president of policy and advocacy at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Armin Yalnesian, economist and Atkinson fellow on the future of workers. And Jennifer Robson, professor of political management at Carleton University. And here in the provincial capital, Avery Schenfeld, managing director and chief economist of CIBC Capital Markets. And it's great to welcome all of you. Uh, to this, uh, just our second program in our 15th season here on TVO on the agenda. And let me just, as we get ready for the Q&A here, let me just throw a few more stats on the record here and then we'll get everybody in on this. According to StatsCam, in the three month period between April and June, the country's GDP shrank 11.5%. Now on an annualized basis, that's 38.7%. And we've never seen a number that big since StatsCan began checking these things almost 60 years ago. In June, however, the GDP grew back by 6.5% from May's level, and that's the biggest bounce back on record, as we suggested in the intro. StatsCan's estimates for July show a 3% increase from June's numbers. So let's sort of figure out where we are right now. Armin, can you give us a sense based on all of that and your understanding of where things are? How are we doing economically right now? So you're right, this is the biggest downturn ever in our history. And it's also notable for the fact that it hit women and low paid workers hardest first. And their climb back has been very muted compared to other re forms of rebounding. So what we're witnessing is yes, a bounce back, but the bounce back itself is slowing down. And one could say, given where we're at in the cycle of the season and flu season coming up and people now starting to get together again in classrooms and in bars and so on and so forth, this is probably as good as it gets. We're not likely to see the same rate of a bounce back as we have previously, which should give us all pause. Trevin, let me put you to work here. And first of all, uh, welcome to the program for the first time. You've never been on before, so we're glad to be able to get you slotted in. Uh, do you agree with Armin on where we're at right now economically? So I think where we're at is that we've entered this second phase of the economic aspects of the pandemic, um, where our recovery is going to be characterized by our economy operating below capacity. So the first phase was obviously basically putting our economy into a medically induced coma where, where we shut a number of businesses and we saw these historic declines in GDP and job losses, et cetera. Um, as provinces and territories started to reopen and businesses started to reopen, we obviously saw a bounce back uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of growth, uh, in terms of consumer confidence as well. Um, but we haven't gotten back up to pre-COVID levels and, and we're not even that close to doing so. Um, and so what we're seeing right now is that there's just this gap between you know the initial rebound and what's actually going to be necessary to get to initial recovery to actually get to full recovery uh, and so you know in terms of the projections most people are probably looking at early 2022 when when we get back to normal when we get, get back to pre-covid levels um, but as Armin mentioned there are a few different variables um, that might accelerate or slow down that process uh, first of all is definitely if there's a second wave 
um, and that's that's going to be a very bad case scenario. Uh, but secondly, is also what the government response will be, um, and certainly we have a throne speech coming up uh, in this month as well, and then we'll see uh, whether the government puts in place uh, what will actually get us towards growth. Um, and then thirdly, there's there's also uh, looking at the international scenario, which will have a huge impact on Canada and, and all Canadians as well, um, particularly with the U.S. election in November. Well, Jennifer, maybe I can get you to pick up the story. Uh, people are wondering, when do we get back to normal, whatever normal means? As you look at things, what do you come up with? I, I wish I had a firm timeline that I could give folks. Um, you know, I, th I think the, the stage that we're in right now is not full recovery, right? We're in kind of that rehab stage after having uh, having gone through that medically induced coma. I'm going to borrow a term that's gaining some traction in the United States and talk about this as sort of a K-shaped recovery, meaning some sectors, some workers are are doing not bad. If you're a higher wage earner, actually, you've you've definitely made up all of the losses in terms of, of your hours. Um, but we're still seeing 1.8 million workers who are unemployed or haven't regained all their pre-COVID hours. Unemployment is still over 10%. You know, the slope of the employment gains is starting to flatten. This is not the curve that we want to be flattening. Um, and there are big gaps that we're starting to see. So there's this real bifurcation in terms of who's actually participating in some of the, the recovery right now. Big gaps by gender, as Armin has mentioned, by income level, whether you have kids, racialized and Indigenous Canadians as well. And frankly, um, you know, the data is starting to show uh, where you live in the country is also uh, going to be important. So it's a... Uh, it's a really tricky spot that we're in right now. I, I, my concern is not only do we get back to where we were in terms of the aggregate, but do we bring everybody along with us? Avery, I gather we're still down a million jobs. What's your sense about what it would take to get those million people back into the workforce? So unfortunately, I think what we've done here is we've picked the low-hanging fruit, and, and now we need a ladder to get the rest of the tree. Um, so what I mean by that is the jobs that we quickly recovered are in sectors where uh, we can operate reasonably well with social distancing. I mean, I think you see some of our, your guests here are sitting at home. Uh, so there's lots of people who can work from home and they're in the sectors where you can do that. Uh, we've reopened stores. And I think one of the things that rescued the economy, I, I like to say it was a masked man. It was the fact that uh, we had superheroes running around with masks that let us open actually more the economy successfully than we might've thought back in April. But the problem is, some sectors, things like concert halls, convention centers, airlines, uh, things where there's a lot of personal contact no matter how you slice it, those sectors are basically at zero. I mean, they're not in a recession. They're in a depression in terms of the number of flights, uh, wedding halls, and so on. There's a lot of sectors that are basically still at zero. And I'm afraid that without the ladder to pick the high fruit, and I think the ladder is a vaccine or a treatment, rather than some magical government program, the best we're going to do for a while for those sectors is help people out with, uh, with government assistance until such time as we have that vaccine, we have that treatment. So we're in a depression in some sectors and we fully recovered in others. And so your viewers are going to either feel that the economy is okay for them or the economy has no opportunity for them. Hmm. Armin, let me get you to pick up on something Trevin said a moment ago, which is, the notion that a second wave could really uh, do serious damage to whatever comeback we are in the process of making right now. We've seen, uh, for example, in France and Italy, they're dealing with a second wave right now, and it's certainly setting them back. How concerned are you about the impact a second wave would have on Canada? I think I'm most uh, concerned about how it materializes and where the vectors of transmission are, how the outbreaks happen. I am really disappointed that we seem to have wasted or squandered the last few months um, in preparation for the back to school process. And uh, whereas Avery is absolutely right that some sectors are depressed because nobody's going to concerts uh, and uh, traveling or very few people are. I think the second wave is also related, uh, not just uh, pandemically, but to the fact that we are standing by while critical social infrastructure is collapsing. So one of those market-led sectors that isn't doing well is childcare. And childcare in Ontario, we are told, 
over 50% of child care capacity or around 50% of child care capacity will not be reopening in the fall. Now, if you had 50% of your roads and bridges not reopening, you'd have a freaking plan, wouldn't you? Because women can't get back to work, and it's mostly women that can't get back to work. And given that this was the first ever she session, uh, you, you simply can't mathematically recover enough work opportunities and earning opportunities. And if women who, as Jennifer actually has pointed out, uh, make up 40% of incomes in households with children, lose their purchasing power. The biggest block of purchasing power loses steam. And every recovery has to be fueled by demand. And so we've got a real problem, and it's not just pandemic, but actually incompetence in public policy to facilitate or, or at least avoid the collapse of social infrastructure that permits recovery for some and does not actually block people's ability to continue to work from home. I mean, you think women have been doing most of the homeschooling and the childcare, as well as the ones that have been lucky enough to work from home have been juggling these three things for almost half a year now. Mm -hmm. And if schools end up not being safe for enough of them, a bunch of them are going to throw in their towel or their bosses are going to throw in their towel because they're not working full time, but they're getting full time wages. Either way, we're looking at more unemployment, not less unemployment in this so-called process of recovery, which could have been avoided with decent public policy initiatives. Trevin, what kind of policy response should that require, therefore? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, first of all, I'll say, like, this isn't just a women's issue, it's an economic issue. I mean, we're not going to have a sustained economic recovery unless women and, and all different groups have the opportunity to fully participate in recovery. Um, and so we've certainly been been advocating for, for child care, uh, obviously some reskilling initiatives uh, targeted towards women as well. Um, but I also want to make the point that, um, obviously, the job losses are, are very big, too. Um, we at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce um, have worked together with Statistics Canada and, and collaborating with them and putting together the Canadian survey on business conditions that actually looks at uh, diversity owned businesses, uh, whether it's women, whether it's indigenous communities, people of color, LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, and, you know, there was obviously a greater impact on, on some of these groups as well. And, and some of these groups is taking longer to recover. Um, but we're also seeing uh, some of these diversity owned businesses also being able or maybe even uh, more interested in, in adapting as well. Um, some of these business owners are using new technologies, innovation, new ways to reach customers as well. Um, at a greater rate than other businesses too. Um, and so apart from the job losses, also, you know, any any economic recovery is going to have to be business led. Um, looking at what supports need to be put in place to support diversity owned businesses is, is also going to be very important for governments to consider. Let me just ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, too, if you would, Sheldon, go to page three and graph number one, and let's bring up the employment rebound graph right now. And for those who are only listening on podcast and not watching, I'll describe this a little bit. Uh, the Canadian economy was moving along tickety-boo from September 2019 until March, April of this year. And then, oh my goodness, did the employment situation just fall off a cliff. Uh, but after April, we are making steps to make that hockey stick, if you like, go back up. Now, it's not a K graph, the way Jennifer described it earlier. This graph here certainly suggests that the employment picture is moving back up adding 290,000 jobs in May, 400,000 plus in June, up to uh, a million in July, 246,000 in August, but we're still a million short of the pre-COVID levels. And I guess I wanna know, uh, Avery, you know, this isn't a K graph, it is a hockey stick. Does it give you um, decent reason for optimism going forward? So I think, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion was about women and so on. I think there's some important issues there with child care. But part of the reason also that women haven't done as well in this rebound is the sectors that were uh, that were down and the sectors that didn't recover tend to employ more women. So if you actually look at sectors like, for example, accommodation, hospitality, food services, uh, those are the sectors that are still down a lot. And, you know, we talked about a second wave. I think there are some employment Im implications there. We won't go back to the full shutdown we had. The good news is that we've learned that things like masks, for example, can allow small retailers to be open without causing infection. But we have opened some things that are on the margin not quite so safe. So we reopened gyms, we reopened bars, we reopened restaurants for inside dining, and that's going to become you know, the bigger part of it as we get past the patio season, which unfortunately in Canada is pretty short. Uh, and, and the problem is we may end up, if, uh, if the cases keep escalating as they have in the last couple of weeks, 
we may up end up having to reverse some of that. So we may have to decide, for example, that in order to keep schools open, we have to get the community infection rates down, which means that perhaps bars can't be open, or maybe the capacity of some of these things has to be limited more. So the problem is going to be that even if, if a second wave hits, we're not going back to where we were in April, but we're certainly going to find it a slower uh, process to get the rest of that hockey stick rebound that you talked about. I think, I think we're going to find that that's tougher going. But we do have to remember one thing about all of this is that, you know, we have to maintain some optimism here. And the optimism is that there's a lot of vaccines in stage three trial, uh, another big slug of them in stage two, stage one. You know, we unlike some other recessions, we do know what the end of this recession looks like. It looks like the medical community riding to the rescue. So if you want to keep your chin up, you could say that the real hero of the story is still coming. And for now, I think we're facing some very, very tough situations in terms of getting the rest of those people back to work because they were working at airlines and people aren't flying. They're working at convention centers. They might have been working at the Air Canada Center. And uh, if there's no crowd there, you don't need the people selling the hot dogs either. So there's there's a lot of jobs that I think have gone AWOL until the medical community has the answers. Avery, the Maple Leafs, Raptors, and in particular, Scotiabank would want me to remind you that they don't call it the Air Canada Centre anymore. It's the Scotiabank Arena now. I work for a competitor bank. <laughs> we have a big, but I'll point out, we have a very big CIBC tower that's being built right across from that arena. And uh, and it's, it's, of course, empty. Uh, it's not quite finished, but are people going to be working there anytime soon? And again, there's a host of businesses that are in our downtowns that depend on people going for lunch, depend on business people taking someone for lunch, not eating in their kitchen at home. And, and that's another huge sector that's really in trouble. Indeed. Uh, Jennifer, let me give you the first kick at these numbers here, and they really do speak to the, the K graph that you introduced that notion to uh, a little bit earlier. Sheldon, stat board number two, if you would, off the top here. Uh, here's the unemployment situation in the month of August. For white Canadians, it's a 9.4% unemployment rate. But if you are black, indigenous, or a person of color, it's 15.2%. And wage employees, and that's basically those earning 16 bucks an hour or less, stands at 87.4% of pre-COVID levels. But for all other employees, the recovery is nearly complete, we're told. Employment at 99.1%. Jennifer, I hear this all the time. We're all in this together. Well, those numbers seem to show that we're not quite all in this together in the same way. Is that fair to say? That's exactly the, the bifurcation that I was talking about in terms of thinking about this as being sort of a K-shaped recovery. You know, um, higher wage workers, like I said before, have regained all uh, of their, their lost uh, hours and, and work. Low wage workers haven't. And what we're partly seeing with those numbers in terms of Indigenous Canadians and persons of colour is the overrepresentation of those Canadians in low wage work. Right. It's it's like that systemic dis, uh, discrimination and difficulty that they've had in terms of advancing in, in labor markets. And that's definitely playing out now. You know, other groups as well that are that are not sharing in the, the same kind of recovery youth under 24, uh, nearly one quarter are unemployed right now. Uh, moms, you know, Armin has mentioned this already, but moms with kids uh, uh, that are school aged kids have recovered somewhere in the neighborhood of just about half, only half of their lost hours uh, from the shutdown. Um, so we have a long way to climb for a lot of groups. And it isn't, I think it's important to recognize that, yeah, there's that intersection between the sector that you work in, the nature of the work that you do, whether you're, you know, a service sector worker, the, the wage that you earned, but also, um, you know, your personal characteristics and the kinds of demands that you have on your time. That's, that's the issue with moms, right? That's why childcare is so important for the recovery. Um, are we all in this together? Fundamentally, at the end of the day, yes, we are. There is no full recovery unless we bring everybody along with us. Um, so we really need to be thinking about how do we support those workers that have not so far enjoyed the gains of the, those low-hanging fruit in their recovery so far. Hmm. Armin, I wonder if there's another phenomenon at play here that I'd like to get you to speak to, if it is in fact the case. Someone who has lost a job as a result of this pandemic 
and perhaps their employer has had to innovate in a very interesting and dramatic way in order to bring the business back. But in doing so, has created a set of circumstances whereby the skills that the person used to have for the old job are now no longer adequate for the new job because there's all sorts of new stuff at play here. As a result, has there been a skills gap created by this pandemic as well? I don't think the response by businesses have been primarily using technologies or processes that have fundamentally changed the skills requirements, but they have fundamentally changed the availability of workers without a guarantee of hours. So the big phenomenon that has happened in the reopening um, has been reduced hours and insecure hours, unpredictable hours, because in the wake of every recession, Steve, um, employers that are struggling with survival turn to on-demand employment. And that has been the case since the 1980s, the transformation of full-time jobs to the hemorrhaging of full-time jobs replaced with part-time jobs. In the 1990s, the explosion of self-employment as public and private sector, large enterprises went down to corporate core competencies. We've seen it over and over again in the in the between the late 90s and uh, the global financial crisis. It was the replacement of permanent jobs with temporary jobs. And this is the first crisis we're going into where apps are in everybody's pocket and workers want um, to work for an app because it's side hustle and helps them stabilize income. Um, consumers want it because it's faster, cheaper, better, more convenient, and employers want it because it minimizes and shifts risks onto workers. So we're going to see an explosion of demand for on-demand worker, workers driven by three factors. <clears throat> and if you think about what both Avery and uh, Trevin have been saying, that the types of jobs that have been lost were amongst, and Jennifer said it as well, low-wage workers. A lot of the reasons why they're low-wage workers is because the businesses themselves were operating on very tight margins. They were marginal businesses with low profitability. And that was at full capacity. And now they're being forced to try and struggle through uh, a period where less volume of business but higher costs means an even thinner margin. More businesses will never reopen, will, re will shutter. Um, and the longer this goes on, the fewer businesses can handle this kind of uh, just collapsing of margins. But as I said, um, childcare is the choke point on recovery. And childcare is treated as a market delivered system. It too is functioning with loss of user fees and higher costs and more of them will shutter and we're just standing by uh, watching this social, vital social infrastructure collapse because of market forces. So there's some sectors that we actually need to immediately address and prevent further loss in. Oh, we seem to have had a problem there with our mean signal, but I, I think we've certainly got the gist of the message she was trying to deliver there as we try to relatch. But Trevin, perhaps you could pick up the story there. Um, maybe speak to that issue of the skills gap, uh, which uh, do you believe that's a phenomenon happening right now? So I don't think the pandemic created the skills gap. I think it accelerated a skills gap that was already taking place. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about a K-shaped recovery, we see certain sectors, you know, technology, software, financial services um, that were able to recover much more quickly than other sectors like accommodation, food services, the arts, travel, tourism, uh, many businesses that almost require physical presence for their business models to work. Uh, and so what that will mean is that the growth drivers, you know, going forward throughout recovery, um, um, are going to be in certain sectors, um, while some of the jobs that were lost have skills that were more suited towards towards very different sectors. Uh, and that's the gap that exists within the labor market. Uh, and so what's really going to be needed is uh, reskilling and upskilling initiatives. Part of that um, should be a reform of employment insurance uh, with a very strong reskilling and upskilling component. Part of that is going to require uh, very detailed local labor market information and local labor market data to find out what skills are available within individual communities, what skills are being demanded by employers, um, how do we fill that gap through education and training. Armin, I gather we lost the last few seconds of what you were trying to say a moment ago, but we've got you back now. Did you want to finish that thought? I guess the most important thing is to echo what Trevin is saying is that the skills gap that I guess you were referring to initially was always there initially. 
um, and it's it's being accelerated, and that's the K gap, the the K chart that Jennifer keeps talking about. So higher paid workers are doing fine, lower paid workers are not. Whether we fix that with uh, enhanced skills, I don't know, because what the pandemic also revealed is the the critical importance of care of the care economy as the uh, social infrastructure to the other part of the economy. And if we just turn our back on that, we're going to see an explosion of inequality, not just uh, kind of living with inequality. We're just going to see it get worse and worse. And we know that that's a drag on economic possibility. Hmm. Jennifer, I, I'd add some. I have Avery. something to add on that. Sure, I, it, we're we're here in Ontario. It would be, I'd be remiss to point out that there is one sector that pays high wages that's that's really down and out, and that's the energy sector in Alberta. So they're they're suffering a double recession, not only because of COVID, but because of a collapse in global oil prices. And in general, here in Ontario, remember that even before this crisis hit. Uh, we weren't doing all that well in manufacturing. So if you go back over the previous 20 years, really, we've been losing market share, not just to Mexico, to China, but to the U.S. as well. So, you know, the people who used to work at the GM plant in Oshawa, they didn't lose their jobs because of COVID. They lost their jobs because Canada wasn't all that competitive in that. So that's an area where certainly a skills adjustment is still needed. I would point out one other thing as well, is that I think Canada has to at least pat itself on the back that we recognize pretty quickly that those people in these uh, sort of gig economy jobs, that um, the unemployment insurance system we had didn't address them because they were largely self-employed. We created a new program in a hurry. Uh, we've extended that with, a, with another replacement for that CERB program. And that's actually been really important, not just for the people getting the benefits, but actually for those people in those higher paid jobs that are still working, because what we prevented was a collapse in spending by those unemployed people. We gave them money to spend, and that in turn kept the economy from falling into an outright depression. So we've done a better job actually than the US, which is now still debating whether they're gonna extend some of these special benefits uh, in keeping the spending level up in the economy uh, by paying people who aren't working. That's not a great long-term solution, but as a temporary fix, uh, it was very important to keeping the economy from a complete collapse. Well, Jennifer, let's pick up the story there because uh, indeed Avery has, uh, has hit on uh, what's undoubtedly the, um, I guess, the happiest acronym in Canada over the last six months, and that's CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which we know is going to be winding down soon. Replaced by something else, I guess I want to ask you, replaced by what? Right. Uh, so I'm, everything I'm going to say right now is all contingent on uh, Parliament actually passing legislation to make this happen. So uh, the one thing we do know is that the wage subsidy is going to remain in place and employers are still going to be able to access that until at least late November. That's actually that's a good thing in terms of uh, anticipating the potential for a second wave because the wage subsidy was one of the programs that I think was probably too late to be launched to actually have the, uh, the impact that was desired. But the benefits for individuals, what the government says they're going to do is essentially a two-part process. Number one, they're changing the rules for EI to try and get as many people uh, into the EI system. So they're they're changing the eligibility standard to make it easier to qualify in terms of the number of, of insured hours. They're giving people a one-time grant so that if you uh, are short on hours, uh, they're going to top those up for you to bring you to the minimum qualification. And they're putting in a minimum floor. So it's a benefit of at least $400 um, a week for up to 26 weeks. And then they're also putting in place a parallel structure because even if you do all of that, um, you're still not going to be able to get everybody into the EI system just by the virtue of how we actually run the system, right? So there's going to be a parallel thing predominantly for people who are self-employed or otherwise don't have uh, insured hours in the EI uh, account. And that's going to be the Canada recovery benefit. I've heard people call it son of CERB or CERB 2.0. <laughs> It's going to be a bit like how CERB has been working in that you apply to it, apply for it through the Canada Revenue Agency, um, but there, part of it might have to be repayable depending on your total earnings. They're also putting in place a couple of other special benefits because we're recognizing, look, we're in a pandemic. You might very well get sick. You might need to take paid sick leave or take some time off from work. And we don't want people going to work if they are ill. So they're putting in place a new sickness benefit. Also, as Armin has been pointing out, you know, the supply of childcare 
is uh, very precarious at the moment, very limited at the moment. Uh, schools in the province are starting to reopen, but we really don't know how this is going to go. I think there's a lot of uncertainty and concern there that flu season is upon us. Kids get the sniffles. It's very likely as a parent that you're going to have to spend some time at home looking after your child because they're not able to go to school. So there is also a new caregiving benefit that's putting in, put, being put in place as well. But look, all of these things are going to be temporary measures. The government has said this is the plan for about the next year. What we still need is long-term, sustainable, systemic reform to our systems like employment insurance so that they actually function for the way that the labor market is in the 21st century. And Trevin, is anybody thinking about that right now in the way they need to be for those long-term solutions? Absolutely. I mean, these conversations are definitely taking place within Ottawa policy circles right now. Um, what's going to be very important is that um, both business and labor have a seat at the table um, since since these are the people that, that pay for employment insurance, uh, you know, 100 percent of it right now, uh, being employers and employees. Uh, you know, when it comes to CERB itself, I think it fulfilled, you know, three very important functions, as Avery mentioned, uh, when it comes to consumer spending, that was very important. Um, it ensured that Canadians, you know, were safe from a health perspective as well and were able to stay home. Um, um, and it also served the function of Canadians being able to pay their bills and put food on their table. Uh, you know, that being said, it's still a stopgap measure. Uh, you know, full economic recovery does not necessarily uh, involve, you know, having everyone on, on subsidies. We need to have that transition from subsidies to an economic growth plan over time. Um, and, you know, most Canadians are not going to be able to return to their normal lives until they're gainfully employed. Um, and so that is really what's what's going to drive recovery um, is business led growth. Um, you know, every recovery is going to involve job growth um, and everyone is going to recover when business recovers. Um, and that's going to be very important too. looking ahead is how do we actually create economic growth um, apart from the supports that have been put in place. Armin, let me ask you about deficits because uh, a year ago at this time, if you and I were having a conversation about the fact that the federal government was running a $30 billion deficit, we would have to have acknowledged that there were plenty of people in the country who thought that was a nasty broken promise and who thought a $30 billion deficit was outrageous. Well, the deficit's now 10 times bigger than that, more than 10 times bigger than that. And everybody seems to think, yes, this was a reasonable response to a global pandemic. What has this taught us about the nature of debt and deficit, how much we can run, when we can run it, how quickly we have to stop running it, in your view? I'd like to go actually back to what Trevin said about a business-led recovery. Uh, businesses have no business unless there's consumers. So what, what, what we learned is uh, and what we're learning from all over the world. I was just uh, moderating a session as past president of the Canadian Association for Business Economics. I was just moderating a session with the Scotiabank's Asia Desk on how they are dealing with recovery and deficit issues. And it is very much consumer led in most jurisdictions because without consumer purchasing power, you have no business. Um, so dealing with, um, and this is related to your question, Steve, in the sense that uh, going into the pandemic, Canadian consumers had the highest household debt level ever in history. And businesses, because of this pandemic, are facing a tsunami of foreclosures without financial assistance. And it may, we may still see a tsunami of corporate uh, debt uh, in the wake of the pandemic. So that leaves it to governments to do something. And of course, the federal level of government is the lowest risk and consequently the lowest cost debt in the entire ecosystem of debt. And we know debt will rise because of pandemic. It's going to rise somehow, either through households, through businesses, through municipal governments, provincial governments, or federal governments. So it is absolutely appropriate that the federal government has done all the heavy lifting and shall continue to do so until we get most of us get back on our feet. But how that rebuilding takes place, how that money is spent, you know, Mae West said something like, uh, it ain't how big it is, it's how you use it. How the borrowed money gets used <laughs> uh, to rebuild back GDP and how it's being, what the returns are on the spending that the federal government makes now has to go beyond just a holding pattern that both Avery and Trevin have pointed out are what our income support programs are. We have to look at how jobs are coming back and jobs will come back as a function of consumer demand. So uh, it's, it's a very tight circle here and we shouldn't be afraid of deficit. We should be afraid of lack of growth 
and we should be making sure that what we're spending on that is creating deficit is actually spurring growth, not only for the short term, but for the medium and long term. I'm pretty sure that's the first time Mae West has been quoted on this program. And Armin, <laughs> I'm, I'm also pretty sure that she was not talking about debt and deficit when she spoke that quote. Uh, all those years ago. In any event, that's our time, everybody. I want to thank Armin Yalnesian, Trevin Stratton, Jennifer Robson, and Avery Schenfeld for joining us on the agenda tonight. Stay safe, everybody, and be well. Globalization was already getting pushback from the likes of the current inhabitant of the White House, among others. Then COVID-19 revealed serious vulnerabilities in the global economy, particularly as supply chains faced unprecedented disruptions. Ian Golden is professor of globalization and development at Oxford University, director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technological and Economic Change, and co-author of Terra Incognita, 100 Maps to Survive the Next 100 Years. And he joins us now from Oxford, UK, on how to build a more resilient global system in a post-pandemic world. Professor, it's great to meet you. How are you managing? Very well, thank you. I hope you all are too. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. I want to start actually with a quote from a book that you co-authored in 2014 called The Butterfly Defect. And here's the excerpt from that. The butterfly defect draws attention to the new nature of systemic risk. Due to globalization, the butterfly of change has lost its innocence, and globalization has produced structural defects that propagate new forms of risk. We face the real threats posed by systemic risks. Financial crises, pandemics, cyber, and other threats could overwhelm the ties that bind us. Deglobalization and slowing growth would be the consequences. These would be disasters for the global economy. Now, that was six years ago. Do I take it then that you have not been completely caught unawares by this pandemic now? No, it was inevitable. And you know, the terrible thing is uh, the surprise is not that it happened, but that we were so ill prepared for it. Well, to what extent do you think this pandemic has revealed how vulnerable our global system truly is? I think it's revealed it very starkly. Uh, what we've seen, and we saw this in the financial crisis, that should have been the wake-up call, that our hyper-connected systems lead to cascading shocks as well as opportunities. I'm a great believer in globalization. I think it's brought more opportunity to more people more quickly than any other force in history. That flows across national borders of ideas, of finance, of goods, of services, of vaccines, of ideas like Me Too and many others have brought progress around the world. But at the same time, our hyperconnected systems are leading to growing interdependence and complexity in what we saw in the financial crisis, what we see in cascading uh, cyber viruses, and certainly what we've seen with the pandemic is this underbelly. The super spreaders of the goods like airport hubs, financial centers, cyber centers are also the super spreaders of the bads, and we need to manage them, which requires coordination, and that's what's being missing. Well, is the appropriate response to this then less globalization? I don't believe so. In, ironically, what we need is some things to be globalized more than politics. Uh, we need to be much more joined up. The scientists are doing a great job in collaborating much more on developing vaccines and stopping pandemics. And we need much more coordination to stop cascading financial crises. And of course, the other unintended consequences of our success, like climate change. It's great that two billion more people have got energy, but the consequence is catastrophic climate change. It's great that more people are taking antibiotics. The consequence is antibiotic resistance. So we need to work together more, and that requires not higher walls and more protectionism and nationalism, but actually more coordination, more political coordination, more skills, uh, more sharing of ideas, and most of all, the will to stop our collective problems. But let me make sure I understand this. As we have increasingly globalized, we have created a more complex and more connected world. And in doing so, it's become more fragile and vulnerable at the same time? That's right. It is more fragile. It is uh, more vulnerable. I think we have to accept that inevitably. In the same way, uh, when we make new friends and we have new family members, we become more vulnerable. When they get shocked, we feel upset. Uh, so we are a more interconnected system, but that's brought the progress. And so we have to understand that these are the two sides of globalization. One is 
rapid spreading of good things and the other is rapid spreading of bad things. And we can't have the good things without bad things, but we can stop them and manage them if we have the will to. Our internet systems connect us. We're having this call through it, but we also know we could get cyber contagion. We also know it spreads fake news, anti-vaccination and other crazy ideas. So these things need to be managed. They don't, we don't stop them by stopping the internet altogether or by stopping financial flows or by stopping uh, energy use in Africa and elsewhere, which is contributing to climate change. We need to manage it more effectively. Well, let's do a real life example here that I suspect uh, that virtually everybody watching us right now will understand all too well. Uh, Apple, the Apple company, they're in 43 different countries on six different continents. And all of that has got to somehow come together to make their products. How do how would they, for example, or any company that deals in that way, make their supply chains more resilient to deal with the reality of today? Well, I think one thing is we've got to get away from uh, just in time to just in case. So build up greater stocks. A lot of these firms are operating with extremely tight deadlines. We have a factory up the road here in Oxford that makes mini BMW cars, and they have something like three hours of supplies, uh, hyper interdependent with factories and supplies all over. And the same is true of Apple and many other supply companies. So some build up stocks, uh, build up diverse uh, capabilities from diverse suppliers uh, is part of that process. And I think try and manage some of the underlying problems. So what are you doing to contribute to more resilient systems? Are you helping, for example, ensure that your workers on the other side of the world are adequately protected against pandemics or other risks? What are you doing in your systems? And I think one of the bad concentration effects that's happened with globalization is the concentration in headquarter buildings. I worry a lot about locations, one place going down. And the more and more there's that concentration in the headquarter building, the greater the concentration risk from that. So I also think we should be spreading assets, we should be spreading management skills, we should be spreading backup systems to different locations around the world. And that builds resilience as well. Well, let me go back to just in time for a second, because just in time manufacturing has been incredibly efficient. It's been incredibly profitable for some shareholders. And I wonder if you're essentially telling these companies, you know, we need you to be a little less efficient and a little less profitable right now in the interests of international resiliency. Well, there are trade-offs and clearly any spare parts and any spare people is cost money uh, and that hits the bottom line. So there is absolutely a cost. It requires investment and it requires more working capital tied up, whether it's on a bank balance sheet and you're holding more capital or whether it's in a factory uh, or in any other supplier, a hospital and the oxygen bottles or the number of ventilators they have mostly not used. That's money tied up. So these are judgment calls and clearly we can't protect ourselves against all eventualities. And we certainly can't protect ourselves uh, indefinitely. But having some resilience, the other thing I would highlight is if we need to stop these problems upstream. The way to deal with pandemics, you know, which have now cost the world economy over $10 trillion, uh, is not to try and all have a capacity in our homes to have enough masks. It's to stop the source of the pandemics as well. And the same is happening on climate change. The same is happening on cyber attacks. We really need to stop these things at their roots uh, to become more resilient as well. And that's completely failed. Uh, we're not seeing, we're seeing the withdrawal from the WTO and the WHO of effort rather than the investment in these international organizations which are de dedicated to stopping these risks. No, I hear where you're coming from, but I'm just trying to imagine going to a shareholders meeting where some shareholder says to management, you know what, uh, I I'm totally fine with the fact that we're making less money and my dividends are lower because we've got a more resilient company. I'm not sure that's a conversation that's ever going to happen, are you? Well, I think it depends very much on the company and it depends what the investors are there for. I think pension funds and other long-term investors that are really concerned on returns over a long period of time are prepared to make these judgment calls. They really care about whether the company is going to be around in five or ten years' time and the longer-term returns. Other people that are trading on a daily basis clearly couldn't care whether the company will be there in, a, uh, in the medium term or not. So a lot depends on which investor class you're talking about, what sort of company and who the owners are. Governments have a lot of 
of shareholding and a lot of influence. So they could regulate and say, we all we need to ensure that all companies have X number of days of supplies. In a hospital, you might say, we want two months of supplies. For a supermarket, you might say, we want two days of supplies. But you can build these systems in, just like in our homes, we have regulations around fire hazard and so on. That costs a lot of money to build in these regulatory uh, protections. We could do that on other dimensions as well. Well, you may have anticipated my next question here, which is, which is, okay, I understand that's the way for the private sector going forward. What about the public sector? Is there a lesson in here for the public sector as well? I think there's absolutely a lesson for it. I mean, firstly, we need to get our proportionalities right here. You know, we spend as countries something like a thousand times more on military protection compared to pandemic protection. Uh, we're fighting the old battles. We're not fighting the future battles, the risks that face us in the future. So looking in the rearview mirror in our politics and allocating resources in the rearview mirror is the first big problem. We need to empower our agencies in our countries, our departments, that are fighting the future. That's cyber, that's pandemic, that's financial stability, it's areas like that climate change, clearly in the green transition. The, the second thing we need to do is be thinking about where uh, are these risks likely to come to and are we working with the other countries, the companies, the cities, the communities that can stop these problems? What are we doing as a country uh, to stop the next pandemic? What are we doing to stop the next cyber attack? What are we doing to stop climate change? These are part of building resilience for the country, preparing for the future generations. And then I think we need to ask ourselves at the civil service level, uh, lower down, is where are we cascading this to? You know, in the UK, and I don't know if the same was true in Canada, we were caught dismally unaware. We didn't have a protective gear for doctors and nurses uh, in hospitals. We didn't have the beds. We didn't have the ventilators. It's that basic sort of equipment that you think, wow, a health system should really have that uh, in the system and where it is. Uh, we knew a pandemic was inevitable. I think there's absolutely no excuse for saying we weren't prepared. Well, you've reminded me that the Premier of the province of Ontario, which is the subnational jurisdiction you're in contact with right now, uh, his name's Doug Ford. And if I've heard him say it once, I've heard him say it 25 times, this province is never again going to be caught in a situation whereby we are not able to manufacture the stuff we need to keep our population alive. And I wonder whether, I wonder whether some of the solution here is to be less reliant on other global partners and simply do more manufacturing within your jurisdiction. Well, that, that's a big trade-off, and I think one needs to think about it in different ways. You know, what Switzerland has decided is that they will stockpile three months' supply on certain things. They don't think they can produce everything, wheat and everything else you need. And I think stockpiling is a very sensible strategy, guaranteeing the supplies. I don't think producing everything you need in any jurisdiction, unless you're an enormous country like China uh, or the U.S., really makes sense. And even for them, it might not make sense. Certainly, if you're very small, country, uh, I think the UK is relatively small and much smaller countries, you really can't produce everything else. It would be enormously expensive. So you'd have to have protectionism, you'd have to have tariffs, you'd distort your local businesses, and you wouldn't be playing to your comparative advantages of what you do most effectively. So I think a, a, that's one strategy. I think a better strategy is not necessarily about producing everything domestically, but ensuring that you have the essentials in some sort of structure, like a country like Switzerland is doing. Mm. As we consider our global institutions in the 21st century, let me put a line to you that you wrote once upon a time. Globalization, you wrote, has led to revolutionary changes that have outstripped the slower evolution of institutions. Amplify on that for us, if you would. Well, globalization has really turbocharged the world economy, technology, innovation. That's the reason we're living in the most rapid period in human history, is because these flows are coming from more and more places. We're learning more quickly. We're throwing out old ideas, taking on new ideas more quickly as a global community. And that's the reason why there's been the most rapid reduction in poverty in history, the most rapid reduction in, in increase in life expectancies, uh, and overcoming of many big problems. So that's why I believe in globalization. It's brought more progress more quickly. At the same time, while this technological and other revolutions are happening, uh, politics is at best evolutionary. Some of us might even feel it's going backwards in some respects. And so that's a major, major gulf that's happening. 
Our politics is essentially national and Westphalian, working on very ancient models of local uh, responsibility and the things that affect us and that will matter to all of our futures, wherever we are in the world, even in the mightiest countries, are coming from somewhere else. If it's climate change, if it's a pandemic, if it's going to be nuclear Armageddon, if it's going to be antibiotic resistance, whatever it's going to be, it's very unlikely that we're going to create it alone and we're even going to be the biggest part of the problem or the solution. And the answer to that has to be we've got to work with others to stop these problems. And so uh, the, the scary thing and the only thing that really keeps me awake is not that these things are happening, but that we aren't reacting in a way. This is not rocket science. Most of these problems, whether they're climate change uh, or whether they're pandemics, can be solved. There's enough smart people around. There's enough technologies around. We could stop these things at source. The question is, do we have the political will? And then we create the economic incentives and other necessary parts to make it happen. And it's that politics. It's that nationalism. It's that we've got to still do things at the national level when we know our futures are going to be determined at the supranational level. Uh, that really is the, the divide that, that's troubling. Well, the one global institution that I suspect everybody knows a lot better today than they did a year ago is the WHO, the World Health Organization. And uh, our future is highly connected with that group. I wonder whether, in hindsight, you think they were up to the task of managing this pandemic. Well, most problems don't require global solutions. You know, even climate change, uh, something like a dozen countries account for 80 percent of the emissions. When you talk about a problem like financial crises or cyber attacks, there's a small number of countries that are the source of most of the solutions and the problems. The problem with pandemics is they can come from anywhere in the world, the richest country or poorest country. And that's why you do need uh, a global institution. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is, has not been fit for purpose, uh, but I don't don't blame and beat up on the organization. They are owned by us, by the shareholders. You know, the US is the biggest player by far in the WHO. It's got the most scientists there, it's given the biggest budget contribution. We've starved them as a collective community globally of the mandate for reform. We've got to insist on reforms. It's like shareholders of a company. If the company is a mess, the board needs to take some responsibility. Well, the shareholders, the board, of these international institutions is the countries, is the big countries particularly. And so when we say the WHO isn't fit for purpose, what we're saying is we haven't given them the mandate, we haven't given them the money, we haven't insisted uh, on the reforms necessary, we need to look to ourselves. There's no alternative other than empowering a global institution to stop global pandemics. Either we fix it and make it fit for purpose, or we're going to have more and possibly more deadly pandemics in the future. Well, let me gently push back on that because uh, you did mention a moment ago that, that politics does rear its ugly head during the course of this. And the fact of the matter is there are a lot of people who believe that China plays a disproportionate influence in the WHO. And as a result, um, who knows, maybe the, maybe the WHO was ham-fisted when it started this because of the place where this virus originated. Uh, maybe a coalition of willing, like-minded, Western slash democratic nations would have been a better way to handle this thing as opposed to a WHO, uh, which may have been negatively um, influenced by China. What do you say? I think coalitions can solve uh, many problems. I'm a great believer in NATO, for example, as, as a force. Um, so there are many things that can be done by coalitions, but unfortunately not pandemic management. Because if once the pandemic starts, wherever it starts, it might be China, it might be the US, it might be uh, in Liberia or somewhere in Africa, it spreads globally within 36 hours through, through airport hubs. And so you need a capacity on the ground to stop it. You need cooperation with the country. You need to be able to get in there. And to, for the U.S. to say, OK, we don't think China is going to be a good partner in the, in the WHO, we just exclude it, is to say, well, I'm sorry, the biggest source of pandemics in the future is excluded from the organization to stop pandemics. How's that going to work? Uh, so I think we have to accept uh, that everyone's in it. Now, that means it's going to have to be operative. China knows and is dependent on the global economy. I don't think China wants another pandemic uh, for itself or for the world. And I think what we will get out of this is the capacity. But if the US says we're not going to play with this institution, we want to create another one, 
I just don't see how that would work. So my own view is, yes, they're going to have to be some really tough conversations. You've got to have surveillance everywhere in real time, and you've got to let SWAT, SWAT teams go in there and stop them. And we have the technology and the capabilities to do that. That's got to be part of the deal, and then everyone pays. But the irony in the, and if you speak to the experts in the World Health Organization, the complaint everyone has had over the last years is that it's been too US dominated. So this sort of thing that it's China dominated, people in the organization, I believe there are many more Chinese scientists in the World Health Organization than there I mean, many more US scientists than there are Chinese scientists. There's a CDC in China. So there's, you know, there has been much more cooperation that's been made out. In our last 30 seconds here, Professor, let's end up on this. Um, I have interviewed other people on this program who have said this pandemic has provided evidence and ammunition to those nationalist forces, uh, rejectionist forces that, that oppose globalization and advocate for more retreating inwards. What would you say to them? I'd say there's no wall high enough that's going to protect you. You know, no, no country can be an island, even the richest country on the, in the world like the USA. Uh, climate change is going to take out Miami uh, through ocean rise. Uh, it's going to, pandemics will affect people desperately. The jobs of the future, the investment of the future, the shared ideas and technological progress of the future, be they vaccines or others, uh, all the opportunities come from sharing with others, but so do the risks. And unless one manages both, uh, one has no future as a country. So I, I believe that the idea that you can somehow build a wall, build an island and be happy forever after is extremely naive, not only because you won't progress. The only country that's trying to do this, by the way, is North Korea. And you see what happens there when you try and isolate yourself. Hmm. It's not gonna lead to progress in your own country and it's going to lead to you being overwhelmed by problems that come from elsewhere. So we're going to have to work together. That's Oxford University Professor Ian Golden. Professor, we're so glad you could join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so it's much and stay safe. And I hope people enjoy the book, Terry Incognita. Amen. Yes, let's plug that. I'm happy to do that. A hundred maps yeah, to survive the next hundred years. Canadian, by the way, uh, Rob <laughs> Mugger, my co-author, is a Canadian. So Wonderful. All the, all the more reason we should buy it. <laughs> you be well, sir. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. As students start returning to class across the province, tomorrow, mental health experts give us their take on back to school. Also, will this pandemic define the up and coming generation? We'll consider that as well. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.